That's dope. Matthew Rozak from Block recently came on one of my live streams and absolutely blew everyone's minds talking about the four pillars of generational shift. He dove much deeper into those here and almost everything else you can possibly imagine. He's an absolutely brilliant mind and this is a conversation that you definitely want to tune in for. So last time uh, we spoke on one of my live streams, that was you cool. had uh, everybody silent and watching as if you were the great professor. And that included Scaramucci and Mark Yusko. Mucci, pretty, Mark, yeah, pretty, Mark's, pretty, Mark's a great good. guy. Yeah. And you made a point that I can't recall exactly, was the four pillars of generational shift, basically. And it was very specifically regard. I remember tokenization being one, Yeah, but I'll let you go. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, the I did a pod, or podcast, I did a TED Talk, uh, The Tokenization of Things in 2017. Um, I had, to, I had to come up with uh, a theme for this TED Talk. And I was, uh, you know, seeing like, uh, you know, Bitcoin, Ethereum, or Ethereum killers, uh, and all these permutations of tokenization. And uh, that was in flight. And then, like, where does it go from there? And it's like uh, tokenization, both um, digital assets and real-world assets, so your, your house, uh, your car, artwork, all that stuff. Uh, obviously, we're seeing that come into focus on getting tokenized. And then it's like, okay, so what? So I have a bunch of tokenized assets. What can I do with this? And then it unlocks this potential for uh, financialization. Like, what does that mean? And again, tokenization, financialization, coordination, and automation, kind of the, those four pillars. And the financialization is, uh, is, is kind of cool because we saw that with DeFi Summer and now kind of the DeFi primitive saying, okay, I've got these tokenized assets. And now how... Uh, can I uh, create liquidity or borrow against these, hedge against these? Uh, and, and there's this notion of uh, keep your crypto always on a treadmill. You know, it's always working for you uh, while, you know, you're sleeping or whatever. It's, it's kind of automated and I have a bunch of ETH that ETH is yielding or I'm staking that ETH and I'm validating and kind of participating in these networks. It's always running and gunning for you for that. So that financialization piece uh, through DeFi is starting to come into focus and we're still early. Um, the, the coordination piece is kind of like what's kind of front and center now, all these DAOs that are um, sprouting up, developing, coordinating, and then you have all this whole uh, VC section of uh, DAO tooling. It's like, okay, we're a community, we're a group, how do we you know, make decisions on governance? How do we communicate? How do we pay vendors? How do we do all these things as a cooperative? You know, it's like you, you think back of like Ace Hardware or Lando Lakes or all the, you know, cooperatives we grew up with, like people getting together, we could buy stuff cheaper, we could sell stuff better. Uh, so the power of the crowd, these communities, these cooperatives, uh, you know, having a, like, a, like, a, like a digital underpinning to them uh, and having uh, kind of coordinated efforts and coordinated benefit off the stuff that they do is like a really big deal. Um, later today, I'm talking about um, Wall Street bets, which is kind of, uh, you know, a lot of Wall Street people kind of dismiss it. It's kind of like a whatever. Uh, it's one of the most important things that has happened on Wall Street. And and I would say this angle of tech, this human coordination technology thing that's going on, which is like, you know, it's, it's on the level of like the Gutenberg press. And I know that sounds kind of preposterous to say. At the same time, um, you know, having uh, all these things intersect at the right time between, you know, uh, collaboration tools, whether it's Twitter, WhatsApp, uh, messenger uh, tools, having Reddit, uh, uh, other kind of collaboration tools, sharing data, being able to punch a button on Robinhood, all these things kind of came together at kind of the right time in the right way. Because, you know, if Scott, if you and I were thinking about Uber 20 years ago, we'd be out of luck. Didn't have the phone. Didn't have, you know, iOS and iPhone wasn't there, you know, commercial grade GPS, payment processing, all those, you know, 100 layers that made uh, Uber Uber kind of were at the right time when it kind of launched. Um, same thing for Wall Street Bets. The, all those coordination dynamics kind of came together in this, in this magical way. And the real takeaway of that is like now this uh, group could coordinate, could communicate and could take action which is kind of like uh, a big deal in terms of um, 
saying like this company needs saving, let's coordinate and save GameStop or AMC or whatever hurts. Um, or this company is a bad actor. Like, you know, ExxonMobil has been dripping oil into the you know, ocean for quite some time. Let's figure out a way as a collective to say, let's point this out. Let's stress test this company to do better. Um, and some of it's like kind of, you know, uh, making money, changing the world and having fun. And so some of that on Wall Street Bets, you couldn't tell what, which was which at certain times. But the, uh, uh, the power that they yielded uh, in that moment in those ways was pretty significant. And so this, again, this coordination uh, in code, in, in governance and, and kind of decision making is going to be very powerful as these communities get bigger. Uh, as these problems get more complicated, there's going to be this action-reaction piece that's, uh, I think, going to be more timely, more powerful uh, than ever before. So, like these these uh, groups of individuals or communities, etc., are now going to wield a lot of power, right. and that's going to be interesting because it's like you know we're, we're always like um, talking about you know growing up like oh uh, vote with your wallet and stuff. Well, like that dynamic gets really. Uh, powerful in the future of voting with your crypto wallet and you know if a billion people like something for a a nickel or a dime or a dollar it moves markets it moves agendas and it kind of uh, impacts the world voting with your wallet works really well when there's a million of you doing it at the same time yeah 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 yeah. and and if you scale that it gets really powerful again the the nickel concept or the dollar concept gets kind of the money gets silly and the impact gets profound Um, so again tokenization financialization, uh, coordination, which is kind of like uh, a lot of uh, the heat map of crypto is, is focused on now, these DAOs, the tooling and the uh, kind of underpinnings of that, and then ultimately gets into this uh, automation of things. And so, you know, humans are, you know, kind of trading crypto and uh, it's not really um, meant for humans. It's, it's more uh, uh, meant for, for machines, machine to machine payments and kind of automation. So. Again, like that example, the financialization, when you kind of put your crypto on a treadmill and forget about it, uh, AI will also help with your decision support based on like, you know, what's your risk appetite, all these other things, and then like kind of create the best thing you can um, think of with those parameters and stuff that you couldn't research or could do on your own and it just kind of feeds that to you. So I think that's going to be another interesting uh, piece to say like, oh, uh, I have... Uh, 10 grand, um, put it and, and achieve the best yield based on my risk profile. Today, DeFi, uh, you know, degenerates are just like aping in, short ranking by yield, not caring about the risk. But if like, you know, I said, well, I want some kind of risk assessment to it, make sure this stuff has been around for a while or tested or whatever. Um, and so all that stuff, I think through AI, machine to machine stuff gets kind of p- puts the whole crypto dynamic into an exponential uh, kind of curve, uh, you know, IoT, and that whole dynamic gets uh, gets pretty exciting. So those are kind of the four ways that um, we sometimes think about uh, this whole tokenization continuum. Because you know, uh, you know, anything that w- uh, can be tokenized will be tokenized. Anything that can be decentralized will be decentralized. And I think we're again still early in this uh, uh, on this arc. Uh, but it's you know no longer a question of like is this going to happen? This is absolutely happening. The risk piece is really interesting because you imply that obviously there's these people who are aping in, taking these tremendous risks. But we've seen recent examples of people who believe they were doing things that were not risky to be on that automated treadmill, lose everything. Yeah, yeah, and we saw that in full focus on Luna, right? Um, and in a couple of examples, like. Um, uh, uh, my company Block built um, a DeFi platform called uh, Vesper, and when we when we uh, the kind of design inputs to Vesper were based on you know a couple of years ago the DeFi summer was you know unaudited smart contracts, unknown teams, no documentation, terrible UI UX, all these things that kind of almost you know um, made you allergic to to even you know uh, getting on these uh, sites. Uh, so we took that as an input to say okay. Uh, Let's have a known team, full documentation, two external audits on every contract, uh, you know, beautiful UI, UX, and really just change that, that whole thing around. And on top of that, start to stratify some of the pools and the yield uh, by conservative um, or aggressive. And, you know, what we learned through that is like, 
people really didn't care about the conservative, even though from a risk standpoint, and what does that mean? It's, it means like, uh, you know, when you, when you typically do in a, in a pool and you go uh, deposit ETH, earn more ETH, you, you know, you open up that treadmill and what happens is that ETH, you know, uh, goes to maker, maker creates die, the die goes to a lending market, the lending market earns a yield, that yield is then uh, put through like a Uniswap and back to more ETH. So that's the, the, the food chain of deposit ETH, earn more ETH, you know, uh, pretty much in DeFi. Um, but those modules sometimes go into other lending markets that, you know, haven't been around long enough, like a compound or an Aave or, you know, a maker uh, and, a, and a die component. Um, and are a lot more, are a lot newer, a lot riskier, uh, trying to reward for that risk, but then just creates a, a more aggressive uh, approach to get that yield. And uh, so we thought, okay, so that's like aggressive, like, you know, the wall clock time of that uh, uh, DeFi primitive not being around so long. Um, maybe it's not audited um, or whatever. So that's definitely uh, aggressive versus conservative. But what you learn is that, um, a lot of times uh, people just plow in and sort rank by yield. They don't care if it's conservative. They don't have to care if it's aggressive. They just want the bigger number. And if you think about it, you know, you're, you're, somebody has MetaMask. Somebody has crypto. They're going on a DeFi website. So the conservatism they're already is there. gone at the door. The, 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 they've already, they're yeah. so far down the risk curve yeah. that they're only there for one reason. Yeah. And, and I think that, that the stratification of risk in DeFi and some of these things will uh, come into focus as more market participants come in, institutions, retail, pension funds, all this stuff will be of consequence. Today, it's like early adopters, so they're just like, okay, just give me the best, right? Yeah. Um, you didn't get there for 3% yield. Yeah, you didn't, yeah. You're not down that curve, going down that rabbit hole, going through all of those platforms just for that. And, which is interesting because you get this idea that all of these average retail people lost all of this money, but they're not quite average retail people, right? Yeah, I mean, they, they had to have assumed some sort of understanding. They had to get there. They had to get to Anchor and yeah. have UST and park for 20% risk. I'm not saying it's not extremely sad, yeah. but this isn't like your average you know, uh, fireman who put his pension. Exactly. No, no, exactly. And, and then just on Anchor and uh, Luna, you know, two weeks prior to uh, that crash, uh, you know, people uh, that I know, like, respect, uh, hedge funds out of Singapore and elsewhere were like, yeah, we're, we're talking about a deal. And they're like um, saying, well, you know, it's, it's, that's kind of a, a risky deal. I might as well just park it and, and anchor and earn 20%. Yeah, the safe like, thing. Th that was the, that was the, the safe thing. The two weeks the before the blowups, you know, sophisticated people still felt that way, which is, which is uh, fascinating. Um, but, you know, you, you take the, the giant uh, kind of macro uh, uh, view of this through, through a, a much, you know, broader lens, 30,000 foot lens. You know, these are real money experiments, you know, so we're, we're testing these shoots and ladders with real money. Um, and, and while Luna is, um, was catastrophic and it hurt a lot of people and, you know, so, some, some people that was their first kind of stable coin uh, exposure and, and, you know, they're, yeah, yeah, and that, yeah. You have to you have to re redefine stablecoin stable coin. today. Exactly. Uh, so that's going to get redefined. Like you know, stablecoins. Like you know, asterisk. What do you mean? Uh, but you see, um, uh, all these uh, tests, all these dynamics are really important um, to get to the final frontier, which is like these are trillion dollar networks, and uh, uh, you know, uh, losing. Uh, 60 billion, 50 billion, 40 billion on, on, on Terra uh, and, and Luna is of consequence, uh, but trillion dollar networks, you know, if you think about the uh, cost to kind of get that developed and get all the uh, kinks out, this is part of that continuum. Um, and it's an expensive continuum, but it's necessary to get where we need to get to. That's I love when uh, people who are new to trading and they lose, their justification is, it's just like my education. Yeah, it's, exactly. It's the, college, it's the education that I paid for. That's <laughs> just that on a much grander scale. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, you're doing it now as a collective of, you know, lots of people. Uh, and so, you know, obviously the, um, you know, some of the stuff should be a little bit more like traditional software where you have stop gaps and you have circuit breakers along mm -hmm. the way. And you're able to kind of, you know, at, at this stage, stop the music in certain instances. Uh, before, you know, ultimately you get into these autonomous networks and autonomous systems where it's like the code is set, 
it's not going to change. And uh, they, those will be the most valuable networks in crypto is the autonomous ones that are unchangeable uh, you know, forever. And you know it just works and does a certain thing all the time. Isn't that risky, though, that you think maybe perhaps it works and you've stress tested and you believe that that's going to be the case and then someday, even three, four years down the road, there's a black swan and all of a sudden that unchangeable autonomous layer breaks. Yeah, no, it's, it needs to get pressure tested <laughs> scary. And, and add some you know, time elements to it. And, uh, but you know, this is what uh, the, the new rails of finance and, and payments and everything uh, need uh, to, uh, to, for us to get there. What are you most excited about that's happening right now? It seems like there's this sort of just diminished optimism at the moment because of price, right? You're getting a bear market and all of a sudden it's like all the things everybody was excited about are dead. But what are you looking at that you think is going to be monumental? Yeah, I mean, I, I've been through uh, a bunch of these cycles and the only thing I could uh, remind myself from the last cycle, and, it, and it's, you know, our, it's nice to get a breather, to be honest, you know, in this, in this cycle, not, not great to see these prices where they're at. But it's nice to get a breather and going through these cycles, the only thing I, you know, my regret analysis, if I could go back in time or back a couple cycles, is to buy more, build more, do more, and just, you know, double, triple down. Because, you know, it's it's like this, this is weird, you know, we, we talked about this in our, our last chat, there's like every time the market goes up, there's like almost this Darwinian hand that yanks you back to test you if you're in this thing for the long term. Because if you're in the short term, you're toast. You're done. If you're in the long term, you're kind of like, okay, this kind of sucks, uh, but I got to withstand to get to the next, um, you know, cycle here and everything's going to be okay. I mean, historically speaking, that's kind of been the trend. So if you withstand that, um, you're going to do extremely well in this space. Um, and that, that means, you know, even buying Bitcoin at 69,000, that's like, again, just hang on, you know, it's, it's like that's uh, a low price for the future. Yeah, I, I, of, of, all, of all the things that, you know, you could think about the permutations of where Bitcoin is going to go, it's kind of, you know, it's all relative. And people are like texting me like, you know, uh, this week, last week, hey, is $30,000 uh, Bitcoin, is that good? Is that the bottom? I'm like, anything in this zip code is like a gift. It's honestly a gift. On a historical basis, going backwards, and then where, where adoption curves and everything else is going to go forwards, it's like this unique moment in time where it's like for sale. It's, uh, you know, some people have lost their, their, their uh, uh, capacity, their, 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 their guts, uh, you know, and, and quite frankly, had to find liquidity and, and, and sell and, and do stuff. And I understand that. But from a pricing st standpoint, if, if somebody's interested in, in Bitcoin, like now is the time uh, to really build a position because it's um, every, every, every downturn like this. I just view it as, it, it, you know, the most incredible opportunity uh, because it's no longer like, is this happening? It's happening. Yeah. And then if you look at like this, this coil of activity that just kind of been compressing on the spring, uh, it's all there, you know, like institutional adoption, you know, people talk about it, you know, in January, even December, by the time like an institution gets into crypto, uh, goes through compliance, builds a fund, the gets the documentation, like risk yeah. managers, all this stuff. It's like July. Yeah. You know, so it takes and if it's a, a pension, it's like seven years. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it takes, a, it takes a long time. So, uh, but, uh, that doesn't mean, yeah, they're probably like, Oh, maybe we should wait a couple months now because of this downturn or whatever. The, the, something might get, rankle them, but they're, they're, they're leaning into this space now and they're building those, uh, funds, those structures, those products, uh, to get their, um, members, their investors, et cetera, exposure to this. And, and so, uh, the institutional side is happening, you know, retail side, um, <clears throat> you're seeing every uh, fintech, every stock app, everybody adopting that's Robinhood, PayPal, you know, you name it. Um, and then what I love seeing is like the inverse, like FTX is now offering stock, yeah. you know, and so it's going to be an interesting dynamic between how this market evolves, both on traditional and the crypto side. Um, and then it'll be also interesting to see how M&A plays out in this space because, uh, you know, historically, you know, uh, tech companies are buying tech companies. Uh, but in this uh, instance, um, and especially in this down market, you're going to see maybe a little bit more M&A. Uh, companies can't raise money or running out of money. So a lot of acquires, a lot of acquisitions. Um, but now for crypto, you have like two massive uh, buyers. You have Wall Street and big tech. Uh, but big tech has much bigger balance sheets than Wall Street. So I think for the first time, we're going to see some 
interesting M&A where Wall Street's going to continue to be you know, hitting their head against the wall because they're not going to be able to compete at the prices big tech is going to pl- uh, pay for these assets. So There's I think a it's- third one is named Sam. <laughs> or, or Sam. I yeah. mean, yeah. FTX, uh, you know, he jokingly says, oh, one day maybe I'll buy Goldman Sachs. Yeah. But I think that they're going to continue. And the crypto industry in general is now going to buy these legacy systems that allow them access or more regulatory clarity. So yeah. getting in reverse, it's not these companies buying some access into crypto. It's crypto buying access into the bigger system. Right on. And some of the, the math on, on when FTX was doing the stock, um, uh, providing stock as a product offering, uh, so that was like a margin zero or a negative margin, but they that said, was we're okay. We're going to lose money. Yeah, we're going okay. to lose money. We're doing zero fee stocks and we make nothing on it, but our business pays for it. Exactly. And the undercurrent of the total value of a customer still works while you still benefit by saying, I could, do, I could buy Apple stock or Ethereum or anything else on one platform. So I think it's kind of a genius move, but it'll be interesting to see in crypto, in um, Wall Street, to see how these two worlds uh, connect and collide. Uh, it's it's, it's uh, not easy to, to, to see that how that's going to come out. You talked about the Darwinian hand sort of of the bull market, and we are human, so it's hard to learn the lessons of the past. And every time you're like, I'm going to sell, I'm going to do it differently, and then you don't. But talking about Darwin, there's also the Darwin Awards, right? The people who get naturally selected out because they do the dumbest things. And it's really (laughs) hard right now to see so many seemingly Darwin Award winners in the crypto space, right? Things are breaking left and right. Yeah. Yeah, no. And and I think, uh, you know, again, it's it's good to get pressure tested in these down markets. Uh, Good to get some of the noise out of the way. Um, You know, there's... You know, I, I get like 10 pitch decks a day from, you know, new deals and, and you know, a vast majority of them are complete trash because people want to jump on decentralization or some kind of, you know, tokenizing a, a hair salon kind of a thing. It's just like, you know, <laughs> saw this movie in the in the Internet days. Uh, but, um, you know, a lot of the, the core business models are super exciting. Yes. You know what I'm excited about. I'm excited about a lot of things and, and Block, our, you know, uh, our, our company is building a lot towards a lot of these exciting things in, in crypto infrastructure and in DeFi and metaverse. Uh, on the infrastructure side, you know, the other thing we're seeing with with institutions is, um, you know, they can't really adopt a lot of of crypto plumbing or infrastructure today as it as it is because it's you know a lot of um, the infrastructure is measured in weeks and months and maybe a couple of years of of being battle tested and it's not really conducive for for them to kind of jump on, on new rails like that. But the the kind of toe in the water is like building funds, building products so their customers could adopt a part one, uh, getting into this baby step of, of staking and saying like, I've, I've got, you know, fiat, I'm going to melt it to crypto, I'm going to stake that crypto, earn a yield. And that's a really important um, baby step for them, an engagement kind of uh, piece for them to get into um, uh, crypto and, and, and earning a yield off of that because there's like this whole, you know, it's a non-productive asset or all this other stuff. Uh, so that's a good uh, step stone. And then ultimately the next step stone is DeFi, but DeFi needs um, some institutional, I think, uh, uh, bumpers around it. And so we're, we're seeing, uh, you know, a lot of uh, DeFi platforms, including Vesper, which is thinking about, you know, uh, how do you cater to these institutions? And that's like uh, permission pools, which, you know, as a decentralized, you know, uh, b- you know, builder of, of, of these uh, new platforms, you know, I feel like it's kind of going a little backwards. Uh, but the next, you know, trillion or 10 of capital is going to come from institutions into DeFi. So you have to kind of cater to them and say, OK, so I've got, you know, this really inspired, you know, 100 plus billion dollar uh, DeFi uh, ecosystem. Uh, I'm going to take a pool and photocopy it for these institutions, where th- where they, from a KYC AM- AML standpoint, could play together, and you know use these lending markets and these these uh, yield markets uh, for themselves. And then so you have like these two worlds: these decentralized world, where you know every you know, goat, goat herder in, in Ghana and taxi driver in Indonesia is using uh, the DeFi as we know it today for yield, for for leverage, and all these things. And then you're going to have this parallel system of institutions saying, "Okay, I want to take some of these uh, primitives and apply them to uh, uh, our ecosystem." Uh, and then ultimately, how do they connect or collide down the road is going to be interesting to see. You talked about obviously offering sort of the conservative all the way up to the aggressive. 
what were the conservative yields? Lower, you know, and 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 so. But is it two percent? Is it ten percent? Is it five percent? You know, I'm it, I, I'm wondering depends. what will appeal to people when it becomes mass. You know, people see this eight percent inflation number. Do they think, oh my gosh, I need to beat eight percent because that's yeah. probably not sustainable? Yeah, no, it's it's not. And and you know, some of the lower uh, uh, yield. Um, pools were on certain assets that were conservative, et cetera. And, you know, it was depending on the asset, but it was anywhere from, you know, 1% to, to 4%, which sounds anemic in the DeFi world. And then the aggressive ones obviously can, can go up, you know, pretty crazy, crazily high. Um, but, uh, you know, as your question, like once retail comes in, how does, you know, this all melt down into, into what's the equilibrium or what, what's yeah, the when, it, when it's not the DeFi degenerates and the normal person comes in, is 4% actually really attractive? Yeah, I mean, um, I think at the end of the day, it's probably, you know, attractive depending on the risk and what's what's in the shoot and ladder that you're putting in. They're never going to look. Yeah, but they're never going to look. You're <laughs> right. They're going to be productized. That's it's, it's a true statement. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I mean, and there's going to be different products. There's going to be fixed products. There's going to be, like, you know, risk-reward products. It's a new project. I'm going to, you know, uh, put a part of my portfolio towards that because it's a higher risk but a higher reward. So, it's again, they're all... Uh, all not the same, and uh, but I, again, the stratification of risk I think is a big uh, opportunity um, and kind of a required kind of dynamic for for DeFi and crypto to be thinking about going forward. Is it fair to say that all of this progress is unstoppable, regardless yeah. of regulation, legislation? I mean, United States, we have obviously have a very myopic view. We believe we're the only people on the planet. Yeah. But it'll just leave the United States and yeah. continue elsewhere, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I think there's, uh, while I c- completely believe that, uh, I just think there's a, a, a missed opportunity in this country oh, of course. Uh, not to, to think through this. And, and it's like, um, I, I've also been advocating in this space for eight years and, you know, met with CFTC, uh, uh, SEC, White House, Treasury, testified in front of Congress, you know, d- you know, um, uh, lots of dinners with with senators and stuff, and, and trying to engage and educate and really uh, present the case for this for this space and how it does unlock a lot of um, amazingness for society, for institutions, and and, and everything. Uh, but uh, you realize that DC, you know, Beijing, Brussels runs at a particular pace, particular cadence, and um, and so you know my you know my advice to, to entrepreneurs when they're building this space is, you know, build responsibly, you know, have good legal advice, uh, you know, have to tokenize outside the U.S. because there's no real clear uh, guidance here. So you see a lot of projects out of, you know, Panama, Singapore, Switzerland, uh, BVI, et cetera. And that's an added cost. It's a hassle. Um, if, you know, if we get this right, I think that that whole innovation cycle, much like the early internet was, you know, U.S. based, and you know, a lot of the value creation and uh, entrepreneurship and engineering prowess, all that stuff, benefited the U.S. like like no tomorrow. We we you know we got a gift from you know China banning you know Bitcoin mining and crypto, like all these things kind of like just aligned uh, for the U.S. Uh, and so, you know, my my initial assessment was like you know we're we're probably gonna mess it up in the U.S. <laughs> Uh, in, in a certain way, yeah, right? I, I but hundred percent agree. But we're we're I, this is like a U.S. thing. We're good catcher uppers, you know. We'll we'll like say like, oh, that was uh, we missed that. We have to really kind of get back into it. So we'll great like tax holidays and like all this other uh, incentives to like you know bring stuff back on shore or whatever. And and I will ultimately figure it out because it's just too big and too massive of of a you know opportunity for the U.S. Uh, to miss. Um, yeah, I, I absolutely agree. And I think that what's being proposed now is at least reasonable. Yeah, no, I mean, I, and you're starting to see like better educated uh, members of Congress, uh, uh, agencies are smarter. Um, and it, when you meet with these people that gravitate to crypto from any of these agencies or any uh, members of Congress, they're some of the smartest people in those, you know, uh, institutions. And w- which is which is really impressive to see because most of Congress is, you know, Average age is, you know, upper 60s. They're mostly like 400. white men, white hair, and and like uh, less than 2% of them have any technical background. And so it's really hard 
You know, uh, it's hard to, you know, if we were the Orange Growers Association of Florida to make them understand certain things because, you know, the industries have very specific stuff. And then you think about all the complexities and um, uh, action reactions of all the crypto related stuff. It's a lot to, to kind of handle on, on their brain. So uh, I think, you know, we're doing some some uh, important things where um uh, Biden had this executive order to say, you know, let's get ourselves organized. And, and that's the best thing that we could hope for. Because it's like saying like, oh, here's the prescription for CFTC. Here's a prescription for the SEC. It's really hard to actually define that now. We need better engagement with uh, the crypto community and these agencies. Uh, but having the edict from the White House to say, figure this out, yeah. research this, get smart on it, it's of consequence, right? That's, that was huge. And I think now everybody's trying to get their their game uh, together uh, on how to um, position themselves and how to like um, figure this out, which which is important. And I think from there you could have better prescriptions for certain agencies and certain things to get identified, whether it's a security or not a security, whether it's a commodity. Uh, but as of late, it's awesome to see some of these senators stand up, have very thoughtful proposals and uh, and and kind of market those, you know, go on podcasts, go on TV and really kind of uh, sell their their agendas, which is uh, impressive to see. Big change over the last eight years. Yeah, absolutely love it. And I think it's very clear, most importantly, that we are moving in the right direction. Yeah, no, exactly. And uh, but then, you know, I, I think it's also, you know, much like anything in, in uh, tech or biology, you need certain test cases. Like it's good to have an El Salvador, a BVI, a Switzerland, et cetera, and to have them kind of go through the first gauntlet. Cause you know, it's like the US is like, you know, um, is like JP Morgan. They're not gonna be the early adopters to this stuff, but they'll slowly kind of watch and kind of get uh, on board. And it went from, you know, uh, Jamie Dimon, JP Morgan as an example, you know, this thing is, you know, a, a big, massive turd to, uh, our, you know, this is super interesting to, you know, their private wealth group saying this is a better alternative than like real estate. Unbelievable. So, so, so you pre know, preferred a risk asset, basically. You know, and, you know, and, and, I, asset. and I've been through so much of this, like, you know, I was in Singapore one time on CNBC and, and like the, the guy in, before me was the CTO of the largest bank uh, in Singapore. And then I come on and then they're like, yeah, the, the, the CTO of the largest bank in Singapore is like, uh, Bitcoin is a Ponzi scheme. What do you think? You know, it's just like, you know, he's just not, uh, didn't spend the time to really educate himself on that. Because any, anybody at that level that understands this uh, in any particular way is at least going to say, this is super interesting. We're going to investigate this. We're going to experiment with this and give it a try versus like being so dismissive over it. So I think we're, we're past the dismissive stage and people are going to be a lot more uh, thoughtful about this and then, um, you know, get more people thinking, researching, adopting, which is, uh, which is good. Well, it's a hopeful, hopeful view and I love it. <laughs> Thank you so much yeah. for presenting it. I really enjoyed yeah. it. Thanks, Scott. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. If you haven't already left a rating or a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, please do that now. Spotify just added ratings, so please go ahead and click that five star. I'll see you guys next time. Mm -hmm.